Thank you, Luciana. That was fantastic. Uh, our next speaker, as I told him before this session, is my big data crush. Uh, I love this guy. Uh, it's Tom Shank. He's the chief data officer for the city of Chicago. And what they have done with open data uh, and what they've done with predictive analytics is a perfect example of how uh, cities play such an important role in public health and uh, they're stewards for such an amazing variety of information and when you do some predictive analytics on it really cool stories shake out and Tom will tell you some of those really cool stories right now thank you for the very kind introduction uh, good afternoon everybody again my name is Tom Shank I'm the chief data officer for the city of Chicago uh, it is uh, just after lunch I appreciate uh, you sticking around uh, I'm going to go through a couple of stories here today about what we're able to do with Chicago and how we're actually op able to operationalize analytics now it's just after lunch uh, I know some of you got lunch some of you didn't so we're going to establish a baseline I come from a different background this is a pothole <laughs> for those who didn't find it. If you come to Chicago, you go to many major cities, you'll find roads that look like this. And this leads to the problem that we have, the problem that you guys have mentioned here today and have at a much bigger scale. Uh, the city of Chicago is only 235 square miles, but we still have, nevertheless have the problem of how do we tell what's happening around this city. So from the pothole that we were able to go up and take a look at, we are able to go to a street and see a string of problems. How are we able to take a look at that across the city? But with the extra twist of how can we then use our 33,000 city employees and deploy them across the city of Chicago to do work to solve the problem? Because we fortunately, uh, and maybe unfortunately, but we have that ability to reach out and make an impact on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the things that was mentioned, I just want to touch upon it, given the audience that's here, is the city of Chicago, as many other cities do, but Chicago is a leader in this, of publishing data online. If you go to the website data.cityofchicago.org, you have nearly 600 different data sets available to you, including, uh, given there's been so much uh, discussion around ve uh, vector-borne illnesses, we have the results of, of our, uh, our water basin traps that we have for West Nile virus as we test the mosquitoes at, at it. So we have 100,000 uh, catch basins uh, throughout the city of Chicago across those 235 square miles and we capture uh, mosquitoes and traps and we test them for a presence of West Nile virus. So you can go to this website and you can download data like that. You can capture uh, what our, uh, given again, what our conversations were. You can see what the water temperature at our beaches are using uh, sensors that we have about two meters deep into the water, which it's available in real time, nearly real time, about every 10 minutes, and also historically going back a couple of years. So there's a wealth of data for those who are interested in research. A number of cities are doing this, and we have a, a quite an interesting array of data that you can go grab from data.cityofchicago.org. So, but how do we take that data, and so some of that data which we publish online, but how do we use our own data within the city of Chicago and improve operational efficiency and improve quality of life? Well, we do it in a number of different ways, and one of the projects, and, and this will come full circle, is we built an internal situational awareness system called Windy Grid. We've actually completely released this code online under the, uh, the name Open Grid. And what this does, it allows us to do is bring together a number of data sets from across the city, whether it's emergency services, whether it's business licenses, crimes, tweets, and we're able to visualize that in one of those kind of cinematic uh, rooms that you will see uh, on TV or on movies to see what's happening across the city of Chicago. And allows us to query and, and able and, and uh, query cross systems, which is really important. I don't know exactly big data is. There's the definitions of the three, four, five Z, Vs uh, that has changed. Uh, but for me, what's important, and for what I think is important for the city of Chicago, is being able to look across our different data systems. Instead of being very deep in any one particular area, our particular advantage is having expansive uh, reach across a number of different systems. So within our advanced analytics unit, within my department, we have a number of things that we work on. Predictive analytics, evaluation, and optimization. I'm going to talk about predictive analytics a little bit today. So again, to establish a baseline, 
uh, uh, the state of Chicago has a responsibility of taking care of these things. Uh, they're often not in teacups. Uh, instead, they're often in our alleyways. So when we, uh, when we have to uh, fight against this, how do we do this more efficiently? Of course, we know that this is a potential for, uh, for illnesses uh, to be spread uh, from rodents to animals, uh, such as a dog, and then a dog potentially biting somebody and spreading the disease that way, let alone the sanitary nature of it all. Well, this is a, a, a heat map, a simple heat map of rodents across the city, rodent complaints across the city of Chicago. Again, you can go to our open data portal and you can actually download this data yourself if you want to double check that. So it seems to be pretty, pretty evenly distributed. If you look closely, there's a little, some little hot spots more so than others. So how can we take this data and use that to improve our decisions? Well, we worked with Carnegie Mellon University in the Event, Spa uh, Event Pattern Detection Laboratory and developed a spatial temporal model to look at correlations between a number of different variables, both in space and time, and the spikes that we have in rodent complaints across the city of Chicago. So we started off with about 350 different factors. We built it down to about 31 predictive variables. I'm, I'm actually going to go back here. What's, what's nice about rodents, and one of the reasons why this was one of our first projects, is from a uh, so, uh, sociological perspective, they're very easy beings to deal with, right? Uh, the predictive variables bo may boil down to things that are complaints about food sources, potential food sources for rodents, or places for them to live. So for instance, uh, people who call us and complain about garbage in their alleyways, wouldn't surprise you that's a good predictor that rodents might be a problem within the next seven days. Likewise, vacant lots is a good predictor that rodents might be a problem in seven days. Now, of course, with any statistics, what's what's more impactful is that we can determine the weight and the importance of every single one of those variables to come up with a Y hat or a particular prediction that we can make across the city of Chicago. So we did that project uh, and we developed a web application that we give a manager. So there's a manager who wakes up every single morning uh, and her responsibility amongst many other things, many other things she's responsible for, is to dispatch to see where uh, sanitarians go to bait and look for rodents. Now again, you can report rodents to the city of Chicago, but this allows us to be proactive. Now when we rolled out this model, we did a double blind A-B experiment with a crossover. So we, when we released this app, the app only actually had uh, half of the city shown at any given time. And we were very strategic about which half of the city we showed because on the other side, we didn't allow predictions to happen. We were able to control that through this, through this application, which if you can't quite tell, is just simply a list of addresses and a, a predictive score right next to it. Well, halfway through the experiment, and the manager knew about this experiment, we switched. And so the areas that were the treatment were then the control, and it allowed us to further validate to make sure that the experiment worked and to determine whether or not we did a good job. Now, in all honesty, what we did was just as well as, as what the manager was able to do. So this manager who's been in this job for 20 years had been sending uh, uh, folks to different locations and we're able to do just as well, but we took all the planning that she needed to do off of her desk. And so she saved about one to two days a week from having a plan to send everybody to just being able to rely on this application which was being uh, handled through computers throughout the middle of the night. But perhaps what was more interesting, we were always thinking about how we were gonna predict where rodent outbreaks were going to be. But I don't think we predict where they're going to be. Instead, I think what we're doing is we're actually picking up on the signal of areas of Chicago who've decided not to report to us. In one of the first reports back we received from the sanitation crews, which was on the first day, they went down an alley, and an alley in Chicago is about five to 600 feet long, came back and said, you know, this was remarkable. There was a huge number of problems, about 20 nests within a five, six, uh, 600 foot area. It's quite clear that, and, and Chicago is a very dense city if you've not been there, people would have noticed this, but yet we never received complaints. So our, our narrative of what we thought we were doing is not so much maybe we were predicting, but we're able to pick up on the signal of those who have decided not to report to the city of Chicago, whether or not because they choose not to, they don't know how they can, whether or not they perceive potential lang uh, language barriers, whether or not they just simply don't want the city in their back alley. Whatever that reason might be, we're able to provide a service better without necessarily having to be asked for. And so we, we think that's a good measure in terms of increased customer service. Now, 
a recent project that we've worked on. So the city of Chicago is 15,000 restaurants and we have 32 inspectors. We're supposed to inspect every single one of these restaurants at least once a year. So this is a classic queuing theory problem. How do we match the inspectors to the restaurants that we need to visit? The places that might be more crucial, that are more, more likely to have a foodborne illness. So obviously we tried to tackle this using analytics. And it's a challenging problem across the entire city. How do we pick out the places of across the entire city? How do we pick out those places that might be more risky, riskier than others? Well, to do this, we teamed up with Allstate Insurance. Uh, this was before our data science team had fully uh, formed, and they worked on a pro bono project. Now I'm going to get to why this matters here in just a moment. The data that we used was almost purely publicly available. In fact, it is completely publicly available. So that website I showed you earlier, data.cityofchicago.org, contains all the data for the statistical model that I'm about to describe here today. And it's an experiment about citizen science, and I'm going to get into that here in just a moment. Uh, sorry, I got a slide ahead of me. Uh, as I mentioned before, all the food inspections is available online. So you can go and see and download every single food inspection that the city of Chicago has done. And as I mentioned before, all the predictors are also uh, available online. So we, have, we determined a number of significant predictors, uh, whether or not the restaurant had a previous critical violation or serious violation. So if you've offended in the past, it's more likely to offend in the future. What the three-day average high temperature was, what the location of the restaurant, the type of facility, uh, the density of nearby burglaries, uh, the density of nearby sanitation complaints, uh, the length of time since we've last inspected you, and the length of time that you've been open. Again, none of these one variables are very challenging. It essentially, it sums up to this. If you go to a restaurant that's fairly new and we have not inspected recently in a neighborhood that does not look like it's the best and that there's some indication that there might be even garbage around in the neighborhood around the area, it's not going to be the best dining experience that you've had. So within all those variables, it's a very simple narrative. Uh, but we're not trying for Freakonomic style research. We're just trying to op uh, improve operations as opposed to trying to find one or two variables that are very uh, uh, counterintuitive or something like that. And of course, when we did this, when we rolled this out, we did an experiment uh, to, to validate whether or not our models work. And so what we did is uh, for a two month period, we had the list of what the work we would have recommended and then the work that was actually done by the Department of Public Health. So these predictions were done before the two month uh, period commenced. And so what we looked at was, okay, are we able to find inspections? Are we able to find problems earlier in the process? So when we look across an entire year and we figure out which restaurants do we want to go to, we need to go to the more risky restaurants earlier in the process as opposed to later in the year. Well, what we found by just looking at this two month period is that we would have anticipated that the Department of Public Health would have found 50% of their violations in the first month and then the second 50% in the second month. Well, what we found is the Department of Public Health did a little bit better than, than uh, random. You know, they found 55% of their violations in the first month. Uh, so that's good. But our model was able to discover 69% of the violations in the first month. So we would have increased our efficiency in the sense that we would have uh, made these discoveries earlier by about 25%. And what that ultimately, across an eight week period, across an eight week period, that two month period, what it would have led to was an average of finding violations seven days earlier. So those riskier restaurants, instead of being at the end of the queue, would have been at the forefront of the queue and it would have reduced the time, the exposure of time that somebody would have had uh, to potentially get food, born, uh, get food poisoning. And I'm not kidding you that during this experimental period, I caught food poisoning. Uh, <laughs> which allowed me to go through the process of what that means to go to an urgent care clinic, to have an IV plugged into your arm, to how, how good that IV felt uh, on, a, on a very uh, dry evening where I was not able to take anything down. So it was, uh, this is real impact in terms of uh, people not avoiding times of going to urgent care clinics, going to the emergency room, and in the rare case, uh, fatality. And this, is, this graph, I love this graph, this shows over that two month time uh, the percentage of critical violations that we found. Now the red line shows the progress that the Department of Public Health made during their own process. So by the end of the experiment, you know, they found all the violations that they found. Uh, but it shows the progress all the way through. Now that blue line shows 
the violations that would have been found under the statistical model. Again, these predictions were made before anything rolled out. And so from the week one, we're able to discover more and able to remain discovering more. And even by the end of the week, it's a little bit hard to see that our blue line flat lines, because essentially we found everything that there was need to find for last week's, and we were just doing pro forma inspections, which is fine, uh, because we still need to do those pro forma inspections. This model is completely open source at the URL uh, below, uh, github.com slash Chicago slash food dash inspections dash evaluation. So the underlying statistical model, the data is already publicly available through the data portal. This allows other people to either adopt the model or see if they can do a better job or also revalidate the work that we have done. And indeed, since uh, we originally did this model, Montgomery County, Maryland, just up the way here, adopted this uh, foodborne model for their own inspection process. So this is government sharing with each other by leveraging open source technologies and open source licensing so we can easily share amongst each other. It also puts out the challenge to others to see whether or not you can do a better job. And we've had hundreds of hours dedicated of, of researchers who've Legitimately, legitimately tried to see if they could outdo our model. And because we did an evaluation, which we explain in full, you're able to replicate our environmental conditions, our evaluation conditions, to show clearly and definitively whether or not your statistical model is better than ours. We use a simple uh, general, generalized linear model. Other people have tried more sophisticated machine learning models of, of, a, uh, of several different varieties and still have not been able to outperform, which is great, but we are looking for people doing better. Uh, this website behind me, I'll, I'll flip back through that. It's a simple summary, a description of what we, have, what we did at a high level. Perhaps even more interesting though is we've also released technical documentation around this, uh, a, a technical white paper describing what we've done in addition to the code that we've released online. And what's also nice is that technical documentation is also completely reproducible. So we're taking a lot of pages out of the open science movement that we see in academia and trying to apply that to government for a few reasons. One, it allows us to, uh, to engage with citizen scientists to see if they can do a better job. It allows us to share with other governments and others who might want to adopt this model. And finally, three, it, it puts us uh, into transparency to show when we say we have a 25% improvement to something, it allows other people to check it as well. And as we've done before, we've created a, a web-based uh, website where uh, every single morning uh, a manager wakes up, uh, goes to her computer, and is able to see where she needs to send her inspectors because we've given her a rank-ordered list. And if she sees a complaint, she can look up a particular restaurant to see what our statistical model is also recommending at the same time. I've already mentioned that the code is open source. And that I, I can't stress upon you about how interesting and, and how much of an interesting experiment it is to see if we can collaborate with others. Uh, perhaps people in this room, perhaps civic community of researchers. Uh, City of Chicago, we're blessed with fine academic institutions of very smart professors and grad students and, and researchers who all have the ability to tackle this model in the same way that we did and see if they can improve upon that model. So this open science, this combination of open data, open source, and engagement was the, the other story behind this food inspection model, let alone uh, solving the problem that we have, but can we do this collaboratively? There's my contact information. I believe I ran a little bit long, so thank you very much for your patience. Many cool stories. Uh, if you haven't yet checked out the Chicago website, I encourage you to do so. It is amazing and inspiring. <coughs> uh, our 